Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for coming to our 15th anniversary soiree. It's not every day that an organization makes it to 15 years. This is a pretty big accomplishment, and we're pretty excited about it. Um, most people here know all about CUAPB, but I'll just give you a little bit more background. My name is Michelle Gross. I'm one of the founders of the organization and currently the president. And our organization is an all-volunteer organization, which is very unusual for considering how much stuff we actually get done. Um, we have run and operated a 24-hour hotline. We have an active cop watch program, a court watch program. We um, are engaged in political activities to try to change the underlying causes of police brutality, and we educate the community. And so we have a lot of very exciting things going on here in the Twin Cities, um, and we have a ton of food, very good food. We've been cooking, some of us have been cooking since the crack of dawn this morning. So uh, before we do anything else, I want to invite you to get a plate and get something to eat because we don't want the food to get cold, and we want you to enjoy it. And then we are going to have a wonderful speaker today. Um, we have brought in, um, from all the way from Oakland, California, Rashida Granada and uh, she can tell you more about herself, but she um, is a person who I think is quite inspiring because she basically, in, a, in, a, in the blink of an eye, lost her family to police brutality. And rather than sort of being what she could have been, which was you know just deep grieving and, and that kind of thing, she turned her grief into action by um, working with the organization Pueblo, which was, is an organization that is dedicated to uh, making life better for the people of Oakland. And um, then now she, and she served as executive director for a number of years, and then beyond that she um, now has moved into the leadership of a portion of the organization Pueblo, which is called the Coalition for Police Accountability. And she'll tell you more about the exciting work she is doing. But um, before we get into any of that, please get a plate of food because we've got all kinds of Great food for you. We've got some vegan options. We've got uh, all kinds of things. You'll see. All right, you guys. Thank you. Thank you for being here. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you Rashida Grenage. Um, I gave you a little bit of information about her before, and she'll give you more. But it is so exciting for us to have her here because they are working on some of the same issues that we're working on. And well, all of us are working on the same issue, but they're going at it in, in nearly identical ways um, in, in um, Oakland. And I think what's going to come out of it for them, if they do, you know, and it's, they're, they're working so hard on that campaign. And I started to say, if they do everything right, but I know they're going to do everything right, um, they're going to come out with an absolutely excellent. Um, real community oversight of police and so that's their goal and so um, it's exciting for us to hear about this and with that I introduce to you Rashida Grenache. Thank you. Uh, fair warning, if I t start talking t and I go on too long, I will probably start coughing. And if I do, I will end <laughs> my remarks. Um, Michelle mentioned it earlier, uh, I got into this situation of uh, working on this issue. Uh, December 15th, 1993, which was when police officers came to my house. I wasn't there, I was at work, but they came allegedly to quarantine my son's dog. Within a half hour, my son was dead, my husband was dead, a police officer was dead, and the dog was dead in less than a half hour. I've written 35 pages after I was able to obtain an audio tape. Remember, this was 1993, no video. Um, an audio tape. I discovered five years after the event that there existed an audio tape that was in the shirt pocket of one of the officers. I requested to get it, a copy of it, and the city of Oakland agreed but they notified the Oakland Police Officers Association who immediately went to court to prevent me from obtaining it. And then I had to go to court as well and I prevailed. And I finally got to hear exactly what happened. And 
At which point, for the first time, I was able to understand and accept that the Oakland Police Department had lied absolutely, unequivocally lied about the circumstances that had occurred. Um, none of it was enough to get me any kind of legal benefit whatsoever, and so I turned my attention to the political rather than the legal venues. I should mention that my husband was African American. He was a musician. For those of you my age who remember Odetta, he was Odetta's bassist for five years in the 60s. My son was 20. And I say that because I don't look like the mother of most police uh, involved shooting victims, but the profile of my family racially fits the profile. And I say that because it's important, because I don't think it would have happened if my husband weren't African American and my son biracial. In fact, I know it wouldn't have happened they would have found another way. But now we are in 2015, not 1993. And the times they are are changing, and mainly because we have video. And so I'm sure you've heard Oscar Grant's story. We wouldn't know Oscar Grant's name were it not for cell phone video. <coughs> and all of the other victims that we've learned about in the last year and a half by virtue of the proliferation of the video. Basically, I knew that I could do nothing by myself. But I knew that for the sake of my family, I had to do something. And I joined Pueblo. People United for a Better Life in Oakland, and we worked on police accountability. The first thing we did was try to strengthen the Civilian Police Review Board. In Oakland, we actually had one of the first civilian oversight agencies in the country as a result of the uh, frequent shootings of black men by the Oakland Police Department at the time of the Black Panthers. And the black ministers in Oakland rose up and said, we had a black mayor at the time, um, the first one, and rose up and said, we, you need to do something. And they created a civilian police review board. But of course it was toothless they had no subpoena power. They had no civilian investigators, so they relied on internal affairs investigations. And we actually, thank you. We actually, I didn't know what happened. <laughs> we went to a hearing, and the hearing was so incredibly unprofessional they didn't have any attorney there to guide the civilians who were asking questions. So the review board members would ask questions of the complainant, like, well, what did you expect that officer to do living in the neighborhood where you live, kind of. And this was the complainant who was there to complain about the officer, but the hearing focused on her and where she lived. So we said, this is just, this is outrageous, and we mobilized. And working with the ACLU and the American <coughs> Friends Service Committee, we organized a huge meeting in the city council chambers, and as a result of that, with lots of folks there giving testimony about how they've been treated, we were able to get a new ordinance that gave the civilian oversight body its own investigators, subpoena power, its own 
independent attorney and a policy analyst to look at the nature of the complaints and what it meant as far as police practices and policies. That was a huge, huge upgrade. And to this day, it remains, I believe, one of the strongest oversight agencies in the country. The problem is it doesn't have authority to discipline. So it has its own independent investigators. It has residents who are like jurors. They listen to evidence presented in hearings and then they deliberate and they can come to findings that <coughs> justify the complainant, that sustain the complaint. But then that recommendation has to go to the city administrator. And it's up to the city administrator, by virtue of the city charter of Oakland, to impose discipline. But the chief of police gets to weigh in also. So if the chief disagrees with what the CPRB has said, then the administrator has to decide. And more often than not, the administrator either rejects the CPRB recommendations or modifies them. In some cases, sustains. But those are typically not terribly serious. We have another problem in Oakland which is that even when an officer is disciplined and is fired, they can appeal to an arbitrator. And again, more often than not, and more often than the national average, they get their job back. We have members in the police department who were fired. <coughs> Now, what happened in 2002 was that we had a scandal, a major scandal, known as the Riders. We had four police officers who were criminally charged, but we also had 19 officers who were tried, civ uh, charged civilly on behalf of 121 plaintiffs, all of them living in a predominantly poor black area of Oakland, West Oakland. And these officers were accused of, in this lawsuit, kidnapping, planting drugs, excessive force, and so typically what they would do is rouse people, drive them to a remote location, beat the crap out of them, take their money, take their drugs, and then bring them back. Or plant drugs on them and arrest them. And so we're talking about 121 plaintiffs, 19 officers. Almost all of the plaintiffs were black. So what happened was that the plaintiff's attorneys, and one of them you may know because he's been on MSNBC quite a lot, John Burris. These plaintiff's attorneys decided they were not just going to settle monetarily. They were going to require the city to engage in a set of reforms similar to what would have happened had the Department of Justice come in and imposed a consent decree, which is what typically happens, probably going to happen in Chicago, already happened in Seattle and Los Angeles and New York and virtually everywhere, New Orleans. But we didn't have the Department of Justice. But these attorneys said, we're going to do the same thing as the Department of Justice would have done. We're going to require that the city fulfill a menu of reforms as a condition of settling this case. So the city voluntarily entered into this 
what's called Negotiated Settlement Agreement, NSA. It included changes in training, changes in recruiting, changes in oversight, uh, I mean supervision, span of supervision, changes in um, updating policy on excessive force, on crowd control, on um, changes in policies around discipline, in investigations of complaints, uh, what else? I mean, it's just 50 tasks. It was supposed to have been done in five years, which would have been 2008. And the language in the agreement says, under no circumstances longer than seven. Guess what? We're still under federal oversight. They are still not fully compliant with all of the tasks. How long has it been? Well, I'm saying since 2003. So we're 13 going on to 14 years into this thing. At a cost of, somebody want to guess? 30 million. How much? 30 million. Well, you, you cheated because you, you heard me say that somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> or you read it somewhere. I know you did. But you're right on the nose. $30 million. And this is on top of $74 million in lawsuits over a period of 10 years. More than the lawsuits from San Francisco and San Jose combined in the same period of time. So that brings us up to what I'm doing now. And what I'm doing now is coordinating something called the Coalition for Police Accountability, which came out of Pueblo but now includes a whole bunch of other organizations, including SEIU um, and ILWU Local 10. Uh, we're getting people of faith, communities of faith. We're getting other social justice groups like the Ella Baker Center, American Friends Service Committee. We are trying to reach out to the <coughs> teachers union and other labor groups and what we're saying is, we have seen a demonstration of what led the police department into this mess and the recalcitrance of this police department to change that has caused it to take this long to come into compliance with these basic reforms. We are concerned that once the city feels that they are fully compliant and they petition the judge to vacate the order and release the city from this federal oversight, our question is, what do we have that's different than what we had when this all started in the way of oversight? What, what, are we, what are we going to be left with that is permanent, ongoing, and sustainable? And the answer is nothing. When this thing is over, we will have exactly the same system in place we had when we started. And we're saying, you know what? That's not okay. That's not acceptable. So we are proposing a change in the city charter that would transfer the discipline of police officers from the city administrator to a police commission. And the model is largely based on San Francisco's model. <coughs> you have a group of commissioners who are essentially there to resolve any differences between the civilian oversight agency that investigates complaints and the police department if they have if they have a different 
a feeling about what happened or what the findings should be, go to the commission. You have an evidentiary hearing before the commission. The commission decides, and unlike what happens now, the commission has the last word. It goes no further, and what council members have called the nuclear option, namely taking away arbitration. So that when an officer is fired or suspended or whatever, that's it. It's not appealable. So we um, are now in the, in the business of organizing the community, doing events, doing outreach, trying to get more and more sectors of the community aware, more and more involved, start raising funds. We do have three co-sponsors on the city council. City council has uh, eight members. We need five votes to get it on the ballot if they put it on the ballot. So we have three co-sponsors. That means we need two additional council members to vote to put it on in November. If we get significant pushback from them about certain provisions that are unacceptable to them, we are obviously going to have to look at plan B, the feasibility of collecting signatures. We have not started that process yet, but we may have to. Even to have leverage over the council so that we can say, you know what, if you insist on taking these things out, we'll see you later, we'll do our signatures, and you won't have anything to say about it, about what's in there. So, our next meeting, which is next Wednesday, that's when we're going to talk about strategy. And, you know, where are we with this? Does everybody agree that that should be our strategy? What does that mean? What are the fundraising implications of starting a signature collection, even as we are still working with the council? Um, what are the legal kind of issues that have to be looked at in terms of final language of draft to present for signatures, meaning that once we do that, we can't change it. So it's, it's complicated, but we are working on it. I want to say, I want to read a quote from someone, I'll let you guess who, about unions, because we know if we can get this on the ballot, we know that the Police Officers Association will do everything they possibly can, including threatening, intimidating, harassing uh, council members and everyone else that they can find uh, to dissuade them from putting it on the ballot. And if it gets on the ballot, they will then mount a huge campaign to defeat it and they will be backed by state law enforcement union who will most definitely contribute to defeating it because they will know that if we succeed, it may set off a ripple effect in other jurisdictions and other cities and it could be devastating to the power of these police unions. Guess who said this? Police unions are, with noteworthy exceptions, a pernicious embarrassment to law enforcement. They've fought ferociously against equal employment opportunity for women, people of color, gays and lesbians. They've opposed citizen review initiatives and undermined existing accountability measures and they've resisted even the most rudimentary reforms in community policing, promotions, internal discipline, efforts to professionalize the service. Anybody want to guess who wrote that? Was you? <laughs> no, I didn't write it. I agree with all of it. <laughs> Former Seattle Police Chief Norm Stamper 
He wrote an explosive book, I highly recommend it, called Breaking Rank. It's a tell-all. It's a tell-all. It's a tell-all about him personally, too. It's very revealing about his early days as a cop and how often and in how many ways he screwed up. But it, it really goes in, I mean, he really takes the covers off a whole lot that goes on in law enforcement that many of us, of course, have known but are not generally accepted by the public. Um, I highly recommend it. You can get it on Amazon or I'm not sure how widely available it is in bookstores. It's been out for quite a while, but it only came to my attention fairly recently when I saw him interviewed on MSNBC last year and he mentioned it. Just to sum up, I think, you know, having done this work for this long, I, I've observed some kind of process things that I feel we sometimes succumb to that are not helpful. A lot of the meetings I've gone to with all kinds of different groups working on this cop watch in Berkeley and a whole bunch of other organizations that have come together to look at this issue every time there's an event that happens and somebody gets killed. We spend so much time regurgitating the problem. It's racism, it's capitalism, it's this ism and that ism and every other thing and we just keep recycling, reminding each other, repeating, um, and, we're spe and we're preaching to the converted. I mean, we're, we, we all know this information, but we, we dwell on it, and we could use the time so much more effectively if we could just all agree that we know what the problem is, we know what has caused it, we know what fuels it, we know what keeps it in place. So let's all just agree to all of that and move on to what can we do. Spend more time on what can we do. What are reasonable, achievable things that we can work on and how can we go about it? But so much of the discourse is, and I understand it because it's emotional. Um, I certainly understand the outrage. I certainly understand the infuriation, the frustration, um, the despair, the anger. I get all of that. But we need to move past it if we're going to accomplish what we need to accomplish and what we've committed to accomplish, which is changing it. Saying enough is enough and we are going to find a way to change the power dynamic because that's what it's about, it's power. Police behave the way they do because they can. Because they can. Just like kids, you tell them don't chew gum in class, but they chew gum in class and nothing happens. So what have they learned? They've learned that words mean nothing if they're not accompanied by action. Police are the same way. You do what you can get away with doing. So if you can beat people up and call them MFs, treat people disrespectfully, shove them around, and nothing happens, where's the incentive to change what you're doing? Where's the incentive to change? Where's the necessity to change? Now, I understand your focus is on financial necessity, right? If it's going to hurt somebody in their wallet, maybe they'll start to think, Whoa, I'm not sure I'm ready for, uh, you know, for an increased insurance premium. 
that's going to have to come out of my wallet. By the way, we tried a risk management strategy in, in, in uh, Oakland as well. It wasn't the same one, but it would, have, uh, it would ding the department for overages in lawsuits. Uh, guess what happened? The city council loved it. They passed it unanimously and secretly behind closed doors. Jerry Brown, who was mayor at the time, now governor of California, told them, you know what? <coughs> Forget it. Don't do it. He didn't tell the council that he was doing that. They thought this program was in effect. <coughs> He didn't tell the community, and in fact, he ordered staff to write reports that were indicating that the program was in effect. And the only way we ever found out about it was because at one point, I guess they got tired of writing reports, and so in the staff report, they said, we. We recommend terminating this program because it hasn't proven effective. So I put a Freedom of uh, Public Information Act request in to say, please show me the history of the transactions. What was supposed to happen was the police were supposed to forfeit 25% of the amount that they went over back to the general fund. So I wrote and I said, please show me the history of the money that went back and forth between the police department and the general fund. And I get back a letter from the mayor's office saying, there is no history of transactions because there were no transactions. And so the cover was blown. But had I not asked for that information, Nobody would ever have known that that was not in effect, even though the council had passed it. Why? Jerry Brown told me after the fact that he, he decided that the police department couldn't afford to sacrifice any of their budget. So he just decided that that was just not going to happen. Was he there, wasn't going to allow it to happen. Was there potential for suing because of that? And that's why I went to one of our civil rights attorneys and I said, this is fraud. And he said, in government, it's not. He said, it happens all the time. He said, I can't tell you how many pieces of legislation have been passed and ignored and never implemented. I mean, I didn't know. But evidently, people in the know tell me that it's par for the course. If the administration doesn't like something and they think it's going to be adverse to some department or other or to the city as a whole or whatever, they just ignore it. The council never checks back. They never investigate to find out whether what they've legislated was ever enacted. Well, it was definitely a wake-up call for me. I can promise you that definitely a wake-up call. But so I understand the principle of financial, putting the financial screws to get change of behavior. The way we're doing it isn't so much of that as it is denying arbitration and taking discipline out of the hands of the department so that the financial challenge comes in possibly losing their job or being suspended without pay for 20 days, or something else which they will then have no control over. Once this goes to the police commission, the police <coughs> department has no control over it anymore, nor can they appeal it to an arbitrator and get it changed. So uh, as Judge Henderson, who has overseen this, said, if discipline isn't final, it isn't meaningful. <coughs> So that's the way we're kind of working at the behavior change incentive package. So I wish you guys all the luck in the world in getting your initiative through. Uh, I hope we are as successful as you have been so far. I congratulate you on the amazing, focused, intense work that you've done to get as far as you have. 
keep it up. We'll be rooting for you. And we would appreciate you rooting for us. And together, we can be inspirational to other groups in other cities and just keep it moving. Just keep it moving and ride. This is the tide that we're on. We're, we're at a moment in history where change can happen. And if you don't believe me, ask Rahm Emanuel. <laughs> Thank you. cake pretty soon to give people a chance to eat some dessert but we wanted just to quickly tell people a little bit more about some of the things that we're working on right now and um, especially about the charter amendment which uh, Rashida mentioned as well as you know some other um, areas of our work and so to do that will be Mr. Vicky. Oh. Well I didn't know I, ahead of time I was going to do that. First of all we have a, a number of areas where we've been working and so many things we've done over 15 years before I even became, you know, very involved in this. Um, I think, you know, one of the things in a 15th anniversary dinner, I can't recognize everybody by name, but just think about the people who have come, who have worked with us, some of whom are still here, some of whom have moved out of town, some who have passed on, but uh, CUAPB is where it is because of an awful lot of people who have worked tremendously hard. Some of them um, survivors of police brutality themselves, some of them not, but uh, people who have known that this is, you know, a tremendously important uh, struggle we have here. So we have several areas where we're working on um, right now in particular. Um, we mentioned the uh, charter amendment for the police to have their own insurance. And yes, this is a thing where it hits uh, financially. And I've heard the proposal for many years from various people of the um, settlements and, and lawsuit payments that the city makes should come out of the police department's budget. And I think, yeah, I mean, that makes a heck of a lot of sense. But it still hits the department as a whole. And we have seen nothing that brings accountability to the individual officer. Even when there's a number of lawsuits against the same officer, there's seldom any discipline at all. I just read in the paper, I think it was yesterday, there's another lawsuit filed against Tyrone Barzi here in Minneapolis, who there has been four payouts from the city just in 2015 for this same officer. Now, this is somebody who should definitely not be on the streets and should definitely not be on the police force. But there is no accountability for the individual officer, though the taxpayers have had quite a lot of accountability for this guy. And far worse, of course, is the people on the street who he brutalizes routinely because those five cases are just the tip of the iceberg. And so if we're going to have an impact on the officers themselves, we need to do something that makes them responsible for their behavior. Now, police really like to be thought of as professionals. And there's been a lot done, actually, over the last 20, 30, 40 years to make police more of a profession. One of the things is licensing. Every um, state has its own uh, post board, Peace Officer Standard and Training, which um, licenses officers and is supposed to oversee the license. That, that gets into another area we've been working on. But um, with pretty much every other profession, it doesn't stop with licensing. It also includes liability insurance, professional liability insurance. So you're responsible for your own actions. And this is important because when you're a professional, you're more than just an employee. You're more than just someone who does what the boss tells you regardless. You have your own personal responsibility, even if, you know, in the case of nearly all professions, even if it goes against your employer's orders, because you have a profession and a professional responsibility. While the cops love the licensing, they hate the responsibility. Um, it should go together. And so um, there are some things that she was talking about that require uh, an amendment to the city's charter, which is like the city's constitution, in order to, um, to do them. The city council could, under the charter, do this themselves, but they haven't shown the slightest bit of interest in it. But we can make it happen. And just as in Oakland, we have two ways of doing it. We can convince half the city council which would be just lovely, and I mean, we talk to them, but um, we certainly aren't going to convince them um, unless we show them that uh, they're, they're going to be just standing in the way of progress anyway, which is why we're petitioning, because this is a way to do something totally as a grassroots effort. We don't rely on the goodwill of any of our elected representatives or city staff, and that's, from our history, a pretty good position 
is to not rely on our elected officials. So if we get enough petition signatures where we're very close already, we can put this on the ballot. We will have this on the ballot in 2016. Um, there's various legal maneuvers they can try, but I think we're pretty safe because as uh, Rashida talked about, you have to do the groundwork first and get everything right. And we've done that. We put it out on the petition. We're close. We uh, need to turn in the signatures um, to put it on this 2016 ballot. We need to turn those in in the beginning of May to give some time for legal challenges. And we can do that. We're going to collect signatures regardless. No matter how many we have, more is better. So we're going to continue to do that this winter, and we appreciate people's help. Um, there's people in this room who have done a great job in gathering signatures, and um, more people can do that. And of course, I hope nobody who is a registered voter in Minneapolis leaves this room if they haven't signed the uh, petition, which we have back there. You want to hold that up? Yay! Yeah. <laughs> okay. Did you just want to sign this to show your support, too, that it's awesome, just so we can have more petitions? Like yeah. Yours, but so. They only count if they're registered voters. This yeah, is a important. tremendous job to do because um, even political candidates who have to petition to get on the ballot, like third parties, only need to get eligible voters, people over 18 who live in their district. Here, you have to actually be registered, and we're checking signatures to do that. Um, and we know who's, who's good on those petitions. So that's coming along. This is a, a huge, it's an innovative thing would make a big difference across the country. It's something people are already starting to follow. So that's one of our biggest areas of work. Something just along the line of that, uh, not something we're doing, but we have a, yeah. a Data Practice Act request um, back there, which another group thought to do this. Uh, one of the things uh, CUAPB does a lot is ask for information under the Data Practice Act, which is like the Freedom of Information Act, only it's the state level. and. Um, I got to a lot of credit to people who have drawn up a data practice act. Thing. Normally just one person or a group puts it in, but they want to give it some emphasis as to how many people look this for this. And basically they're looking for all information the city has about uh, since November 15th, and you know that date, Jamar Clark. The fourth precinct, occupation, Black Lives Matter, uh, uh, the uh, head, union head crawl, who's been so bad, and protest. And so that should get out a lot of information because the, the, the shooting that happened on November 15th was terrible and absolutely unjustified. But everything that's happened since then has also been terrible and done in the light of day, you know, not in the spur of the moment or anything else like that. The city has made a plan to cover this up, do public relations, so we're helping people do that. And the more people who sign this, the more we send in. And it, it, uh, give some power to make the city do something about that because, boy, they don't want to. We work in uh, a number of other areas, like I mentioned the post board, that's the um, licensing board. We have found through our own um, um, complaints we put in there that the post board uh, does absolutely nothing once, a, once an officer gets a license, and they do some good things with training and, and education standards and that. But uh, once an officer gets a license, they wash their hands of that, they have a license for life, unless they, you know, commit a felony or behind bars, basically. And that's not way it, how it's supposed to be, and that's not even how it is in law. So we've been working on that for several years. It's a, it's a big project. We appreciate the help, and we want to hear from other people who have had problems with the post board. We're working to get rid of what passes for civilian review in this city. Um, it's called the Office of Police Conduct Review. Um, it replaced the Civilian Review Authority a little over three years ago utterly worthless. We have the statistics out there that show it. Um, what isn't shown on there is we say in there that one officer in two and a half years, one officer got two weeks of unpaid vacation as a result of somebody's filing a complaint with the police department. A thousand or so complaints. One officer, two weeks. Turns out that one didn't even come from a civilian complaint. So they are batting zero at this point. Utterly useless. It's a, it's a cover-up. So. That's something, just as Rashida talked about, how we've got to have some discipline, a real civilian review authority, but we can't have that until we get rid of the uh, sham that we have there. Um, yeah, so those are some of the things we're doing. we got a lot of things going forward. Um, I know there's a couple of other big areas we're working in them yeah. at a loss, but um, yeah, so you want people to say, yeah, yeah. Just, so do we fill this out and send it in? Um, fill it out and give us back, give it back to us, and we'll send them all in one envelope and save some postage. And do you think they'll send this back to personally send us? Um, they have to contact each person. Okay. Yes, which they can do by email. 
um, it's been checked out that it's not going to overwhelm the system and keep it from um, you know, handling the other data practice things we have. We are working on getting data about the Jamar Clark shooting. The city, at this point, uh, out of the public data that's actually required in law, which is not a whole lot, they basically told us the day, date, and location, and um, the ages and genders of six witnesses. And that's it. <laughs> Utterly outrageous. So um, this is the kind of work we have to do, and we've been doing a lot of work. Of course, we've been doing a lot of work around the Jamar Clark shooting from working with the family to being up at the 4th Precinct to doing this out. Uh, we've drafted a list of demands that we feel are um, related to this and something that, uh, you know, are directed to the right people and something that's uh, doable. And we have that out on the table also. It's a list of 11 demands. Um, people might find that interesting. Um, yeah, as I say, we have the statistics. So, and there's a lot of other good literature there that I hope people will take a look at and, uh, and join in with us because there's something for everybody here. <laughs> this is how we keep going for 15 years, so, yep. So, um, a couple of tiny things I'd like to just say real quick. One of the things is I'd like to actually acknowledge Michael Friedman in the room, because Michael Friedman is the, the individual who came up with the idea for the Charter Amendment in the first place, yep. and we just took his great idea and made and are running with it. So, I wanted to acknowledge him and also to acknowledge his um, uh, many ways of assistance um, with the CUAPB over the years. He's been a real friend to CUAPB, so I wanted to um, particularly, not that you were expecting me to call you out, but I wanted to call you out in particular and say thank you because that was an awesome idea. And, you know, <laughs> like I said, a guy who's really thinking about new ways to do things, and that's where we really are. And also I want to just say thank you to everybody here. Um, you guys have been our friends and supporters for all this time, and um, we have lots more work to do. We've got 15 more years at least of work to get, to get done. Um, and so we look forward to having you be part of that work because, you know, um, we, we, it takes all of us to do this work. This work is not um, anything that one person can do. This is, it's a tremendous amount of work. We're all volunteers, um, which is highly unusual. We have no paid staff, and yet we get a lot of things done. We work with families every single day. We um, answer a 24-hour hotline with all volunteers. You know, we do all kinds of things all the time, and it, uh, it's exciting and fun work. And if you, you know, we, we're delighted that you work on it with us, and we'd invite you to get even more involved in the next years as we come, as we move forward. So, you all, thank you so much. And um, one thing more. Well, one more thing. One more thing. Okay. And then we'll cut uh, the hey, cake. the money pitch. Right. Oh yeah, the money pitch. That's right. <laughs> Cole reminded me, but yeah, um, this is a free dinner where we love to feed people and get people together and celebrate the good times and the hard times. So, um, you know, as I say, it's a free dinner. It's a donation. But if you can help our work, that would be much appreciated. And uh, the dinner is free, but the cake is $30 a slice. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> gonna be a point that or you can get in now. the door, but if you want to get out. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there's another way to do it. Uh, seriously, um, we, we always need money to do this. Um, some of the court challenges we do, just the petitioning we do, all of that stuff takes, takes some uh, resources. We do it on, frankly, very very little resources. This is a very, very frugal group um, about we do on a little bit of money. So whatever you can give really does go a long way and we sure appreciate it. There's a bowl in the back there. Thank you.